So, I was asked to tell you more about the perspectives for future research. And actually, well, we talked about my speech, uh, we decided also that I would tell you more about my own research work and how it is evolving. So uh, maybe I will uh, dwell a bit on that, uh, about uh, my own research. And everything started 20 years ago. Well, 20 years uh, is quite a good amount of time. And uh, I remember I was contacted by Stefano Vaccari, young uh, mayor of Nanantola, that was 1995, almost 20 years ago. And I was asked to write a book about the Villa Emma of Boys and Girls. And uh, well, I was contacted uh, by the CEDEC in Milan, by Mrs. Otto Lenghi, and she thought I was the best person to write such a book because I had already written another similar book about hiding Jews after 1933 in Italy. So I knew the historic context very well. I already knew a bit the story of the Villa Emma uh, uh, youngsters, but in a very superficial way. And still I realized that uh, I made uh, uh, some mistakes, but still, uh, I knew the, the context quite well. So, that was the starting point. But before being able to accept Stefano's invitation, I had to double check uh, if that kind of research work was feasible, was doable. So, I had first to carry out uh, a first round of uh, uh, surveying work, and I realized that in Italy there was very little, in Germany there was even less. And so everything was getting very complicated and would depend on uh, archives in Israel. I had the chance to go to uh, Israel. Stefan was invited and asked me to go with him. He was uh, invited there for a Yad Vashem meeting uh, in autumn 1995 on Villa Emma Youngster. So he, Yad Vashem in autumn 1995 invited the Villa Emma uh, boys and girls to celebrate uh, the 50th anniversary of their arrival to Israel. And so I had the chance to meet all of them, or at least those who were there. And uh, so I could uh, make appointments, uh, and uh, I met uh, Joseph Indy, the team leader, and uh, his wife Lily. They met in Switzerland. She usually she came from Berlin, and then she <coughs> went to Belgium, and then France, and then Switzerland. And they met in '44 in a Zionist Institute in Switzerland. And Joschko, Josef Indig, came from uh, a German-speaking uh, Hungarian family. He, uh, his father was uh, a choir singer uh, in uh, Hungary, but then they moved to Croatia. So, uh, so you can well understand that the context was quite uh, complex, but knowing German was key to write that kind of book, not just for the interviews, but also for that, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to, for instance, to communicate with uh, uh, people from Yugoslavia. And um, I didn't speak a, a word of Hebrew and not even of Serbian or Croatian. So that was uh, a crucial pre-requirement. And um, so that was key because also some people settled it down in Zurich and others in the States. And Max Fiedemann, unfortunately, is now suffering from uh, dementia. And so they are slowly uh, disappearing, and uh, this is very sad. And some of them are not uh, uh, able to uh, speak any longer, like Angela Tuchner. This is very sad. 
So I could say yes after that experience in Israel. I said that the project could be launched. But of course, well, there was no specific documentation on Villa Emma. And uh, there were many uh, sort of elements on other parts of the story, but not really on Villa Emma. So, on the one hand, uh, there was a, a sort of uh, virgin land. But then I asked uh, Angelo Spagiari, the director of the Modern Archives, uh, to ask him if maybe he had some uh, papers about Villa Emma. And he told me that, unfortunately, those documents were not uh, available for public consultation. And he told me, well, probably there's nothing for you. But he was wrong, because actually then the archives were made public. And very important documents uh, were found, like the uh, Salomon and Papo, and also other documents uh, from the Carabinieri of Pavola, who talked about uh, his arrestation and his um, transfer to Fossoli camp. So there were very uh, interesting things to be found out. And uh, when I stepped into the Uh, modern archives uh, premises, uh, Spajari told me, oh, we already know each other. And I said, oh, really? And uh, he reminded me that actually in 67, when I was writing my PhD thesis, I had already worked there. And he told me, oh, yes, I was the director's assistant. I used to bring you. I mean, what you needed. So again, we became friends, and then he uh, brought to me some uh, types of papers that were quite confidential. So I was the first who was able to see these types of documents, and uh, I could see the internal correspondence of Villa Emma the Friedman Report and other papers that became essential for my book. So, well, that was a stroke of luck. Nothing less, nothing more. And so I'm really grateful to Mrs. Pajari for this uh, great sign of trust. And, uh, well, and then uh, Mr. Kramer the president of the Jewish Committee of Modena and Mrs. Ottolenghi really, again, uh, entrusted me with the greatest level of freedom to write a book about Villa Emma. So suddenly, I found documents, and then documents kept growing. And so the book grew, too. It was published. Uh, in 2000 in German and in 2001 in Italian. The Italian edition, unfortunately, wasn't very lucky. A couple of thousands of copies were uh, uh, made, but then, well, the publisher decided to stop the publication without uh, giving me notice. And so at one point, uh, Fausto wanted to buy a certain amount of uh, copies of the, uh, of the book, but actually they said no. But uh, they didn't say that, uh, I mean, they had decided to destroy all the remaining copies and not to publish it any longer. Well, it was quite sad, but the rights are owned by Rizzoli. And uh, at that time, I had uh, successfully worked uh, with uh, Mr. Cotignola. But uh, then uh, the publisher was sold to Rizzoli Group. And then I was in Germany. And so I lost track of things. So in Italy, unfortunately, things did not were not very well. But then I continued my research. Uh, in Germany at the Anti-Semitism Research Center. And uh, then my work was published uh, in a scientific collection. 
and uh, so it didn't uh, reach a great audience. So I decided to publish it again in German, and it was published one week ago. I'm very happy of that. And uh, on the cover, there is a reproduction of an old painting made by one of the girls of Villa Emma, and she gave it to the municipality of Mantua. And uh, uh, we also presented that uh, here some years ago. And uh, well, I have other projects. I am writing a book about a German a painter, very well known, Uden Friedrich, who was reported to Auschwitz from Florence. And I would like to reconstruct, uh, I mean, his journey. And uh, I really want now to complete this project. So this is one thing, and then there's something else. I really didn't want to do it, but my aunt was a sculptor, Jenny Wickman Muki, and she's still very appreciated in Milan. And uh, she lived with her husband after 1933 in Milan. And at the end of the war in the 50s, she went back to East Berlin together with her husband. And um, in Germany, so far, there has been uh, no comprehensive exhibition of her work because actually, She has never been considered as an artist to be fully presented. And she started with Holly Hart, and then she went on with a certain political and social commitment due to her participation to the Italian resistance as a resistance fighter of the Garibaldi Brigade. And so I couldn't say no. So probably I'm quite busy for the next two years. Well, as to the Villa Emma uh, youngsters, so Joseph Indig memories were published. Anin Fuga. Well, this is my own title. It was not the original one because uh, the original title was not available any longer because there was a novel by Giuseppe Pederiale published by Mondadori with the title I Ragazzi di Villa Emma. So the, the, the title was already used and protected and it wasn't possible to use it. So that's why I thought about Anin Fuga. And um, that was written in 45, soon after his arrival in Palestine. Memories were still fresh. And uh, I was given the original manuscript in German that was made of 460 pages, was uh, a bit sort of confused. And I was afraid I would never make it. But then after some years of work, I was able to come up with a good text. And uh, also I had uh, a uh, the Hebrew text, but uh, I couldn't uh, handle uh, Hebrew directly, so I needed uh, a translation. So I needed a translation, and uh, a translation was made uh, by one of the former guys of Villa Emma. Uh, but then, uh, I mean, uh, he was uh, arrested <coughs> and deported together with the father. And uh, he made a Hebrew, a German uh, translation, a uh, Hebrew English translation. I found a publisher for uh, the US, uh, but in the 70s, 80s, uh, a text of such kind. Uh, written by a socialist close person was absolutely unthinkable. But, well, uh, I kept working on the other version. And uh, again, this is something I talked about in my introduction. And then 
there is a journal of Shoshana Rari and Sonia Boris. Maria talked about that yesterday. She had a copy in German. The German edition was published last year, and the Italian edition is almost ready. So we could publish that for the next uh, Memorial Day. It's very important to have a, an immediate testimony of a girl from Villa Emma. I missed that when I read my book, and I said it also in my preliminary introduction. It was sad not to have it. And uh, say so that was interesting, but this is not uh, the same thing. Now we have it, and uh, she was uh, invited to Berlin uh, with uh, a Berlin uh, by Berlin Foundation. She's even 87 years old, and she's in very good health. And I was very happy to meet her in Berlin. And now we would like uh, to uh, work on some Stolpersteins, where she used to live. And she would like to pay homage to her brothers and her parents' memory who were killed by the Nazi. So the Chinese edition is uh, underway. Right? So basically, there are three books. My research, based on the archives, Yoshko's memories, and the Journal of Shoshana, and again, for the very first time, the voice of a girl. I don't know, maybe we will find other texts in the future. You never know. Something may happen. Personally, I didn't see much left, but why not? So which are the most widespread avenues of research? Yesterday at the airport, I wrote the Tagesspiegel, Berlin's newspaper. I was reading that on the plane, and I see a picture of the father of Lily Levin, and uh, she gave uh, her journal to Shoshana because they were friends, and I just knew that her father was uh, a music producer in Berlin. But then I, I knew about uh, her escape, but that was it. And uh, now there's a, a band of eight musicians that the Jewish Museum in Berlin on the, uh, June the 26th would make uh, a concert, Rescue Treasure. And they collected all these uh, discs that are still uh, available of this Herr Schlevin, of this producer, who was probably active until 1938, because limited activity was allowed until a certain time within the Jewish community, so it could not uh, work for public uh, events, uh, but it could keep on working for Jewish events, Jewish cultural events, so that was possible. So, uh, so there was this continuation of these uh, disc production, but then they were destroyed during the 38 uh, Crystal Nights, uh, the program. And so these eight musicians found these uh, discs back and are going to present this concert for the very first time on June the 26th at the Jewish Museum of Berlin. But I will get in touch with the curators of this event some of them are researchers. Probably they, they're not researchers, so probably they do not know anything about, I mean, the daughter of this man. So again, you see, things sometimes happen just by accident. And when it comes to research, we could retrace uh, the life uh, 
of these guys as uh, Anna Maria did for uh, Solomon Papo in Sarajevo. So there are things that can be still found and uh, also in the 50s it was possible to ask Germany for the to restitution of some documents. So that is another way to see if some documents were given back to the people after the war. So again, this is how we could keep working our research in Germany. So something could be done. And then there is another interesting project about a Polish Jewish uh, in 38 he used to be deported to Poland it was the prelude to deportation it's a massive uh, sort of uh, transfer but it was not complete yet it was not the SS but local police he used to deal with that and some were deported some were rejected at the border some could go back to Germany. So there are many possibilities, actually. I always ask myself about the parents of these guys, <laughs> if they had already been deported, and where, how many, and who was still in Berlin. So this could be something else. And There's a publication of other documents. When I published uh, the book on Villa Emma, I also thought about a documentary appendix, but it was really quite heavy, so I decided to not to do it. So we may publish a collection of documents. That could be another possibility. I don't know if this is going to be completed. And recently, Silvano Longhi published something in that respect. Silvano Longhi in the Germanic uh, Historic Institute collection will be published. It will be published both in Italian but also in Germany because we presented at the University of uh, München and I am in touch with Silvano. And uh, so I also uh, keeping an eye on a Dallasim documentation project. And 10 years ago, I wrote an essay for a specific cultural review of uh, some uh, Hebrew and Jewish institutions. And I hope that this is going to be continued and completed. And so I remember that there was a researcher who followed Italy, and I hope that this is going to be published very soon in Berlin. There's a study center in Berlin. So this researcher is very good and she's very competent and skilled and I hope that this researcher whose name is Sarah will deal with that. If I didn't have the Villa Emma project, I would have carried out this project right away. But uh, and so this is another possibility. Just to give an idea of how many things can still be done. So. When it comes to the jealousy and documentation, it is important then to integrate uh, some uh, Villa Emma papers because Villa Emma was an essential activity and uh, it was underestimated and uh, not well known by Jellisem. Uh, okay. I just want to conclude because I've already talked too much. So, it would be interesting also to carry out uh, some research work about what happened after the war. Because in 45, an agricultural school was established here until 48 for Jewish displaced people coming from other countries and uh, who want to leave for Palestine. And uh, so, we don't know very much about this project in this second period. And uh, 
I really recommend carrying out interviews because I met some people from Nonantola who told me their version of the story. And uh, maybe this second part of the story is still vivid because, uh, I mean, it's slightly more recent and there is no fragmentation of the memory. So it would be interesting to carry out this work to enrich, I mean, what has already been done. So in this case, uh, we should consider, on the one hand, uh, the Zionist documents, which are mostly written in Hebrew. And again, the language can be an issue. Many, many Tana researchers do not know a word of Hebrew, but until 45, almost all Zionist deeds and documents are written in German because, I mean, it was mostly about uh, German-speaking uh, managers. But then I cannot uh, manage any Hebrew document because I don't speak Hebrew myself. But there is a young researcher here in the room, Mrs. De Padua. I hope that maybe she will pick up this suggestion and maybe she will go back to that because we need to start working that. I think this is paramount to start also if we would start quite late, especially about the fate of displaced people after the war. So this is another avenue of research that in my opinion is very interesting. Why was it so that there was this almost affectionate sort of Welcome. So when I was told that uh, we were uh, sort of obliged to see terrible propaganda films, uh, well, that was true. I can I can <coughs> believe that. And uh, so terrible things were done. We should delve a bit more into the educational world of Nanantel of that period to understand why, in spite of the propaganda, in spite of what was said about uh, Jewish people, while well, there was this uh, empathy that was expressed by the local people towards the Villa Emma youngsters. And so we should also consider that aspect because that could be another interesting topic. Right, so I really want to end now, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.